Hello, my name is Steve Antonuccio, and I want to thank you for inviting me today to this program. I particularly want to thank Amanda, who scheduled this program, hard to believe, three years ago, and then COVID happened. So I'm glad we were able to finally do this. And I'm also want to apologize for any technical problems earlier today. What I'm doing is I have a, a, a software program that I can record my PowerPoint with my voice. And I'm going to do that and put it up on my YouTube channel. So hopefully you'll have a chance to see everything with the beautiful visuals with it as well. Anyway, I wrote a book about my career as a librarian called There's No Such Thing as a Typical Librarian. The book's available on Amazon. And I spent 30 years working in both public and academic libraries. I spent four years at Pikes Peak Community College as a media specialist. And I spent 20 years uh, working for the Pikes Peak Library District, uh, running their Library Channel 17, an educational access channel uh, that was provided by the cable company, as well as uh, funding for some of the equipment that we needed to program it. And it was a great job. You know, for 20 years, I did over 100 documentaries on a variety of people in Colorado Springs, video portraits, I like to call them as well as histories on certain aspects of Colorado Springs or El Paso County. Um, and I got to meet some wonderful people and document their lives. And then I, in addition to that, I, I put together uh, an archive of historic films that were shot in uh, Colorado Springs, um, as many as 150 films uh, that were shot by a variety of people, um, primarily from the Alexander Film Company, which moved to Colorado Springs in 1928. It was a larger producer of theatrical advertising, what they called advertising playlets. And eventually when television uh, began in the 50s, they started doing uh, television commercials as well as theatrical commercials. And they were a large employer in Colorado Springs. At one time they had over 600 employees. Um, and because of that, there are a lot of their people that work for them uh, had the ability to make films. They made a lot of local films, and I was able to collect many of those. And then uh, Colorado Springs, certainly from a, a photographic standpoint, being such a beautiful city, um, a lot of great photographers uh, were moved to Colorado Springs just to shoot just to shoot photos. Um, and the city was captured in in photos as early as the, when it uh, was uh, when the city was founded in 1871. And the earliest film that was shot in, in Colorado Springs was by the Edison Company in 1897. So we got a pretty nice collection of historic films uh, in uh, special collections, as well as wonderful photographs. And you can access the photographs on the digital archives through the digital archives of the, the website. And then most of the films that I'm gonna talk about today are on YouTube. In fact, the way that my book is written there's an index on YouTube. If there's a chapter in my book I'm talking about, there's a visual reference on YouTube. You can see the documentary or the historic film that I'm talking about. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about one of the stories in my book, which is on Fannie Mae Duncan. It's called the chapter in my book is called Everybody Welcome. Um, and she was a fascinating woman. She uh, was the granddaughter of slaves. Um, and in a very short time after she moved to Colorado Springs, she saw the need for businesses that would cater to the African-American community. At that time, segregation was practiced in Colorado Springs and blacks could not go to the Colorado Springs restaurants. They could not stay at the Colorado Springs hotels like the Antlers Hotel and the, and the Broadmoor Hotel. Uh, and she saw a real need, you know, it's insulting to spend your money in a restaurant that you could only call by the phone and pick up at the back door. And she decided that there really needed to be businesses uh, run by African-Americans, owned by African-Americans that were for African-Americans. And she opened up her first restaurant in Colorado Springs in the, in the late 1940s. Um, but there are other chapters in this book. There's uh, 50 chapters and each chapter tells a story. That's what I like about this book. You can pick it up, read a chapter, go on to the next, and then you can go on YouTube and watch a film that relates to that particular subject. And then the last uh, seven years of my career, I spent as a branch librarian uh, for the Pueblo City County Library District. And it was one of the best jobs I ever had. I, I really enjoyed it there. Um, I worked for the Barkman Branch Library, which was in the Belmont area on the east side of Pueblo. And Pueblo is 50% Hispanic. Um, 
that particular branch served a community that was probably 70% Hispanic. And it was a working class neighborhood, a real neighborhood library um, where people can walk or kids could ride their bikes to the library. And I felt that our community, you know, most communities enjoy using libraries, but I felt that our community really needed our library. Certainly the, the kids needed it. Um, we were overwhelmed uh, during the summer reading program. We would break all kinds of attendance records, including the fire marshal code uh, with having too many people there. But I was delighted to see it. I was delighted to see kids in the libraries, parents in the libraries using our services, the, the computers to look for work. Um, and it really was a great experience. And, and you get to know your patrons when you're a branch librarian. I think it's one of the best jobs in the library profession. So I also write, that, write about that in, in, in my book, my time I spent in public service, which I really enjoyed. Now, today I'm gonna to talk about Fannie Mae Duncan. And this was a photo that was shot by Lou Tilly, who had worked for the Alexander Film Company. Um, this was shot in 1955. And he had a friend that wanted to do an article on Fannie Mae and sell it to Life Magazine. And so he went to Lou and he said, you know, could you follow her for a couple of weeks and take pictures of her? Now, his friend was never able to sell the story to Life Magazine. Um, but Lou had all these wonderful photos that were hidden in a drawer for a number of years. Now, when I did the documentary on Fannie Mae Duncan in 1991, I didn't have as I didn't have access to these photos because I didn't know Lou at that time. I did a documentary on him in 2000. That's when I discovered these photos. I wish I did because they're wonderful photos. They capture Fannie Mae Duncan in her prime. She was in her mid 30s. She had already have opened up four successful businesses that catered to African Americans. Um, she was a millionaire by this time. She lived in a mansion, a 42-room mansion that she used as, kind of as a bed and breakfast for African-American families visiting Colorado Springs because they couldn't stay in the hotels there. And she also allowed her musicians to stay there. And her mother lived with her there. Her mother, mother named Maddie, uh, who she loved very much, admired her, got her work ethic from her mother. Um, she lived with Fannie Mae uh, for the rest of her life. Uh, and she was kind of the house mother of this mansion and would cook, she was from originally from Alabama and cooked these wonderful Southern foods. Um, so it was a great place to visit. Uh, the other documentary that was done in 2018 was by Rocky Mountain PBS, Colorado Experience, Fannie Mae Duncan, and it's produced by Kate Perdoni. Uh, both of these documentaries are on YouTube and I highly recommend watching them. Kate's documentary is excellent. It's an hour long and she interviews a lot of the family members. Now, Fannie died in 2005, so she obviously couldn't interview Fannie, but she did incorporate the interview footage that I had with Fannie Mae Duncan from my original documentary. Now, when I produced the documentary in 1991, I showed it on the Library Channel, and there was an English teacher named Kay Ismail who saw the documentary on YouTube, and she was looking for a story that she could turn into a play for her students that had a uh, minority lead. And then she saw the documentary, she said, this would be perfect. So she called me up and she said, uh, could you give me her contact information? I was glad to do that. She went up to Aurora where Fannie Mae was living with her nephew, Les Franklin at that time when she was in her seventies. And she sat down with her, she talked to her, she interviewed her. She got all this information on her life story. And then they put together this play, they ran it for several years and the students just loved it. And Fannie Mae would come down to Colorado Springs to see the performances, and she really enjoyed it. And then after a while, Kay said to her, you know, you really should write a book about your life. You had such a fascinating life, you know, being the, uh, you know, the granddaughter of slaves and becoming a millionaire in Colorado Springs, you know, at a time when uh, segregation was practiced there. And uh, Fanny said, well, I wouldn't know how to start it. And Kay said, well, I'm an English teacher. I could, I could help you with it. So they got together, Kate interviewed several times, recorded these interviews. Uh, Fannie Mae died in 2005 and Kate continued to write the book and she was able to publish it in 2013. And it is an excellent book. I highly recommend it. Um, it's not available on Amazon. Well, there are copies, there's used copies on Amazons, but if you wanna buy an original new copy, you can get it at most Colorado Springs bookstores. Um, and then Bob DeWitt, who has a kind of a history bookstore in Colorado Springs, you can get it through him, 473-0330.
but I highly recommend this book. The, the first half of the book is about Fannie Mae's early life. Um, her father, Herbert, and her mother, Maddie, uh, growing up with all this love in a family of eight kids. Um, they had a, uh, they were sharecroppers. They had a cotton farm in Luther, Oklahoma. And both her mother and father worked on the cotton farm. But her mother also took care of the kids, cooked the food. So her mother literally worked uh, from 5 a.m. in the morning until 11 p.m., taking care of all the responsibilities. Now, the second half of the book is on Fannie Mae Duncan, the entrepreneur, her successful businesses and how she got involved in uh, putting together these various businesses that cater to the, primarily to the African-American community. But it's, it's an excellent book. I really highly recommend it. And this is one of the pictures that Lou Tilley shot in 1955. This is Fannie Mae with her mother, Maddie Bragg. And she really admired her mother because her mother took care of her when she was younger. Her father died in a car accident when she was around nine years old. And so it kind of tore the family apart. Her mother couldn't keep the house. and um, She had eight kids to take care of. So she would send the kids out. They lived with uh, family members. And then they were able to co go to Colorado Springs, one family member at a time. Uh, Fanny's older sister, Frances, took a job as a, uh, a housekeeper for a rich white family in Colorado Springs. And then eventually she was able to bring other family members, get them jobs. And then the entire family finally made it to Colorado Springs and they, and they lived in a small house. But uh, Maddie took care of Fanny when she was a girl and Fanny took care of Maddie uh, until the day she died. She, again, she lived with her in her mansion. She was a house mother for the house. And, and Fannie Mae's work ethic, she, cap, uh, she copied from her mother, watching her mother uh, juggle all these things in her life. And this is Fannie Mae as a young woman, beautiful young woman, had a real charismatic smile. Um, she always wanted to go to college. She was a very good academic student. And she wanted to go to Langston College, which was a historically black college in, in Oklahoma. And that was her plan. She, but you know how life is. Life kind of got in the way with those plans. And when she graduated from high school, you see her with her charismatic smile. Most of these photos, you see this beautiful smile that she had. And that was the key to uh, one of the keys to her being a successful business person is people loved her. You know, you couldn't meet her without feeling like you were her best friend. Uh, but anyway, she was a good athlete. She played basketball. And then this man started coming to the basketball games when she was 18. And his name was Ed Duncan. And he became interested in her. He was six years older than her. And so he asked her out. And Fanny said, well, you're going to have to talk to my mother first before I go out with you. So he sat down uh, with her mother and he said, uh, you know, he has uh, honorable intentions. And he wants to date her and he's interested in her. And so they start dating. And then he asked her, asked Fanny to marry him. And when she was 19 years old, they got married. And unfortunately, that kind of put off her plans to uh, go to college, to go to Langston College. And they both were working very hard. They were saving money. Ed worked uh, as, a, as a porter uh, for the train station. And Fanny uh, worked in various restaurants, which was good experience for her as a waitress. She got to see how businesses were run. And then she got this wonderful job as a manager at the PX in Fort Carson that was there for African-Americans. Now, back in 1942, when Fort Carson was completed, uh, they had separate barracks for the African-American soldiers, and they had a separate PX that Fannie Mae run. The Army uh, became integrated, totally integrated uh, by the Korean War uh, by 1948. But at that time, they needed someone, an African-American person, to run uh, this PX. And Fannie was perfect for the job. She ran the, photo, uh, the soda fountain. She'd make her banana splits. And she was very popular with the African-American soldiers. They loved to flirt with this beautiful young woman. The soldiers that had literacy problems, she would help them write letters home. Um, and it just was very successful. You couldn't get a seat in that place. And they actually grossed about $1,000 a day back then. And Fannie Mae was on a salary. And she thought, well, you know what? Um, you know, I'm not getting paid more money because of all the business. She says, if I could make this much money for the government, I could do this for myself. 
So she looked for an opportunity in Colorado Springs to open up a restaurant uh, that catered to African-Americans. The soldiers who come into Colorado Springs can go there. And then the families in Colorado Springs, it wasn't a huge African-American population back then. It was about 3%. But at least they could spend their money in a business that didn't require them to go through the back door. And so she decided uh, to uh, see if she could find a place to lease. And there was this... Uh, 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 service club that wasn't doing very well um, that was the building was owned by the city and they were leasing out the restaurant and she went to the city manager she said i'd like to have you know have a chance to open up a business uh, that catered to the african-american community i'm running the px at fort carson right now and so he gave her a chance he put her on a trial period of, of just a few weeks and when they opened up their doors and her husband quit his job at the uh, train station and became the cook um, they were busy from the moment they started. It was just crowded with people. They were delighted to have a, a restaurant that they could go to. Um, and then her husband was a handyman. He could fix almost anything. He was good at plumbing. He was good at carpentry. And so if they needed anything, he could fix it himself. And that allowed them to save their money. If you have a small business and you can do things yourself, it really makes a difference. And so businesses, the business was going very well. And then Fanny started thinking again. She says, you know, we're leasing this space. Um, if we found a building that we could buy, um, we could get a mortgage on it. And all the money that we would spend to the mortgage would go to our equity in the building. And so they found this huge building on the corner of Colorado and Sawatch. And they opened up their restaurant uh, called uh, Duncan's Cafe. And this, again, is one of the photos shot by Lou Tilly. Beautiful photo. I love this photo. Fannie Mae is at the counter. That's her brother, Cornelius, that's talking to her. But if you look at the detail of the photo, it says Monday special Irish stew, 85 cents. So you really get a sense of the time and, and how much things were back then. And so they own this big building, and she wanted to fill it with businesses that catered to the African-American community. So what she did is she put in a barber shop and a beauty parlor and, and downstairs on the left there. And then she looked at this huge space that they had upstairs. And she was wondering, what could we do with that? You know, and Fort Carson had become integrated by then. And she said, you know, I bet we could have a nightclub. Her and her husband, Ed, would go up to Denver to Five Points to this nightclub up there. And she said, you know, we'd have these wonderful performers. The the best performers in the 50s were African-Americans in terms of blues, rock, jazz music. And they couldn't perform at the Antlers or the Broadmoor Hotel. So she said, if we open up the nightclub, they could perform here. And I bet it would be very popular. I bet a lot of people would come to it. So they decided to call it the Cotton Club, like the Cotton Club in New York. But the Cotton Club in New York had already closed by then. But the difference between the Cotton Club in New York and the Cotton Club in Colorado Springs is the Cotton Club in New York was owned by white people, uh, had black entertainers, and only white people could go inside the Cotton Club in New York. The Cotton Club in Colorado Springs was owned by African Americans, had mostly black entertainers, and both blacks and white could come into the club and enjoy some of the best music of the 20th century. And it was very important to her to make sure that whites could also go into the club. Um, she said to people, I don't care if you're uh, green, pink, or blue, as long as you have money that is green and you're 21 years old, you are welcome in my club. And people would just call her all the time. The white soldiers from Fort Carson, the Hispanic soldiers from Fort Carson would call her and said, you know, we'd really love to go to the show, but we don't know if we would be welcome in a black club. And she says, it's not a black club. It's a club for everybody. And so she went to her husband. She got tired of all these phone calls. She went to her husband. She said, clear out everything in the front window, all the advertising, everything. And she had to make a great big sign that said, everybody welcome. And that's who she was. That was her personality, too. She just was welcoming to everyone. And she was a smart businesswoman. She knew she couldn't survive if all she had was Black people going to her nightclub. She needed the white college students at Colorado College, the, one that, the ones that were 21, to go to her club. She needed the white soldiers at, at uh, Fort Carson to go to her club. Uh, but it was important for, for, for her as a businesswoman and who she was that they could come in there, feel comfortable, enjoy themselves, listen to some of the best music of the 20th century, um, and go home. 
And she always put together, made a card that she would hand out to people. The, the building was right on Colorado. So as you entered Colorado Springs, you couldn't miss the Cotton Club. And on her card, it said, easy to find, hard to leave. And it was hard to leave. Once you went there, you did not want to leave. Now, Fanny and Ed had always wanted children of their own. And unfortunately, uh, Fanny got pregnant in 1945, and she carried a child uh, the full term. And that child died the day that it was born. On, and they buried the child, uh, Yvonne Dolores, on June 11th, 1946. Now, they're not sure what happened. But the coroner said that he thought the child's skull had been uh, crushed. And he thought maybe uh, the doctor using the clamps delivering the baby had accidentally crushed the baby's skull. Um, but it was a very tough time for, for Fanny and her husband, Ed. And they went into mourning. And the way that Fanny May mourned is she just kept busy, what got busier in her businesses, just tried to stay busy so she didn't think about this tragic moment in her life. And Ed did the same thing. He just worked harder. But for him, he had been an alcoholic. And when you're running a nightclub, and you have access to liquor, it's not a good thing. And so he drank too much. He ended up dying of cirrhosis of the liver at the age of 42. Now, when these photos were taken, Ed had died a few months earlier. This is 1955. And this is the prime of Fannie Mae Duncan and the Cotton Club. This is the prime of her business, the Camelot years. Uh, she was making lots of money. Um, she had this exclusive audience that couldn't perform anywhere else exclusive performers that couldn't perform anywhere else but her club. Um, and and uh, she, you know, had this 42-room mansion that people could come to and stay at if they were Black and visiting Colorado Springs. And this is the iconic photo of Fannie Mae Duncan shot by Luke Tilley. And this is everything you need to know about Fannie Mae, her uh, gregarious smile, her positive attitude, her welcoming uh, personality. This is the house band performing behind her. But this is when the uh, Cotton Club was in their Camelot years, probably from 1950 uh, to 1965. And of course, this photo was 1955. This is another great photo shot by Luke Tilley. This is uh, some of the family members. F Fannie Mae had about 30 employees, and half of them were family members. But at the top, there's her brother Cornelius, her nephew Les Franken, Franklin, Les's mother Selena, who was a singer, beautiful voice, and a beautiful woman, as you can see, and Fannie Mae Duncan in the middle there with her characteristic smile. And this is Fannie Mae's sister, Selena. Selena was a beautiful young woman. She had met this musician in Colorado Springs that was from LA. Uh, she ended up getting pregnant and they married. When she moved back to Los Angeles. She married him. She was pretty young back then. She had her son, Les, and then Selena started singing in local nightclubs in Los Angeles. And she was very popular. People loved her. She had a beautiful voice. And then she started singing with Lionel Hampton um, and touring all over the country. And here's Lionel Hampton here. And then unfortunately, her husband got involved with drugs and it destroyed the family. So she ended up divorcing him and she was tired of being on the road. She wanted to raise her son less. So Fannie Mae called her up and she said, you know, we're starting this nightclub. You could perform at the nightclub. Uh, and, and when there wasn't a, a, a touring band uh, performing, uh, you could be the house act and, and perform with the house band. Um, and you could also help me out in the business because you have a lot of contact of these musicians who are on the road. And so she moved back to Colorado Springs. She brought her son. This is her son, Les Franklin. And he grew up in a wonderful atmosphere. Um, with his mother, with Fanny. Fanny's husband, Ed, was kind of a second father to him. And it was just a wonderful experience for him and a great business education for him. They bought him a shoe shine stand that he worked. Um, he also did other work for the Cotton Club. And he was a good athlete. He played football. He went to uh, CSU Greeley on a football scholarship. And then he majored in business. And he ended up getting a job at IBM. He was an executive at IBM for 30 years because of his business education that he got uh, uh, with his mother and, and his aunt, Fannie Mae Duncan. And he always credited Fannie Mae Duncan for, for teaching him how to uh, run a business. And this is Selena, the beautiful Selena. Again, she would perform uh, when the, uh, as the house act with the house band when the headliners uh, were not available. 
or between headliners. And uh, she was kind of when when Fannie Mae's husband died, Ed, she kind of became Fannie Mae's business partner. She really helped out with whatever Fannie Mae did wanted. And Fannie Mae would like to travel to New York. She was very much into the latest fashion. And she was rich at this time, being a millionaire. She would buy the latest in fashion at New York, bring it back. Um, and when she was gone, Selena would take care of the business. So between these two African-American women, they really ran this operation. And some of the great musicians that came through the Cotton Club were Louis Armstrong. And, you know, it was a small club. Maybe 200 people could sit at tables. So you can imagine how intimate it must have been to see these performers. B.B. King, one of the, probably the greatest uh, blues musician uh, of his era. This is the house band performing. These are all Lou Tilly shots. Count Basie, great jazz pianist. Duke Ellington, great jazz pianist as well. And of course, the wonderful Etta James, one of the best voices of anyone in the 20th century. And she would sing her original songs uh, at the Cotton Club. Can you imagine, you know, being a Colorado college student and coming into this club and sitting, you know, maybe three rows back and listening to the beautiful voice of Etta James? Now, this is Fannie Mae. This is another photo shot by Lou Tilly. This is Fannie Mae going home to her mansion. And the reason why she built this mansion uh, or, or moved this mansion is because she wanted to open up a hotel or a bed and breakfast that African-Americans could stay at and musicians could stay at. And she also always wanted to live in a mansion. That was her dream. So she found this mansion. I think it was on uh, Wood Avenue. And there were only certain streets where blacks could live on. So she went to the police chief and she said, I'd like to take this house. And I talked to someone and they said that they could move it to North Corona Street, which was one of those streets where blacks could live on. She said, I'm going to have to break it up into three pieces <clears throat> and they're going to put it on a, a flatbed trailer and move it. And the police chief said, yeah, I think there's a need for this. So uh, so they broke the house up into three pieces. They put it on a flatbed trailer. And when they got to uh, Nevada Avenue, for some reason, the city stopped them and said, you don't have the, the right permission to move this house. So the house sat there for two weeks on Nevada Avenue. People would have to drive around it. And people were laughing at Fanny. They called it Fanny's Follies. But it was not funny to her. This was her business. This was her livelihood. So she finally got permission uh, to move the house. She moved it to North Corona Street, 615 North Corona Street. And here's the mansion after she moved it. Beautiful home furnished with the latest in, or with furnished with lots of antique furniture. Um, and just a great place for her to live, great place for the musicians to stay, and a great place for other African-Americans who were coming into town and couldn't stay at the hotels there uh, to stay at when they could see the sites in Colorado Springs. And also her mother lived with her. She was the house mother of the house. And like I said before, she was a great cook. She was from Alabama originally, and she could do all this great Southern cooking that the musicians loved. And that house is still there. Fannie Mae probably moved out of the house around 1975. In a couple of months, I went uh, to the house to shoot these photos, 615 North Corona Street. And the house is so big, it took me two pictures to shoot it. And it's now a group home for the mentally ill. Now, it really should be a museum. If I have anything to say about it, this should be a museum honoring the contributions of Fannie Mae Duncan uh, to the city of Colorado Springs. Now, these are more photos that Lou Tilly shot um, in uh, uh, 1955. And this is Fanny in her home. The antique furniture, she had worked as a domestic worker for this rich family. And when they died, they had an estate sale and she bought all of their antique furniture. She had always admired it. And she furnished her 42 room house with this antique furniture. Now this photo is the photo that's on the cover of the book uh, that Kay Ismo wrote with Fannie Mae Duncan. And you can see Lou Tilly in the mirror there. You can see his torso and his arm. And I wanted to include that. In the book, they Photoshop him, shopped him out. But Lou Tilly was from the South, and he got along great with Fannie Mae. She was a country girl from Oklahoma who had roots in the South. And, they, and he followed her for two weeks, and they became good friends. They're about the same age. And she really appreciated the photographs that he shot. And I love this photograph. You know, Fannie Mae was a charismatic person. She loved everyone, treated them well, but she didn't want to get between Fannie Mae and her money. 
And she made sure she protected herself. She was her own security guard. You can see that 45 on her bed as she's counting her money. Now, this is the police chief at the time. This is Chief Dad Bruce. He was a bit of a redneck, a good old boy. He was actually from the South as well. But he got along famously with Fannie Mae Duncan. Um, he really admired her and her business sense. He also knew the value of having businesses that served the African-American community. And between the two of them, they kept the peace between the races. Fannie Mae was like the black mayor of Colorado Springs. If you had a problem, if you had an issue with the police, if you needed a job, if you needed to borrow money, you could go to her. And as long as you were honest with her, uh, she would go to bat with you and, and certainly uh, protect you from Chief Bruce or work with Chief Bruce. Now, Chief Bruce would pull out, provide her with policemen to help operate the club. Because when you're running a nightclub that caters mostly to soldiers, young soldiers who have a high testosterone level, um, there's gonna be trouble if they drink too much. And Fannie Mae always made sure that people could come into her club, feel safe, have a good time, but if they were to cause any trouble, she would deal with it immediately. And of course she had policemen there to help her. And uh, um, she always supported the police charities. She be believed in, uh, in the police force in Colorado Springs, and she worked closely with them, as well as with Chief Bruce. Now, this is a story about her brother, Cornelius, who has the chef hat here, uh, chef hat on in this wonderful picture uh, that was shot of Duncan's by Lou Tilly. You can see Fannie Mae Duncan all dressed up on the corner of the, the soda fountain. Now, uh, Cornelius had gotten involved with a white woman, he had gotten her pregnant, and the white woman's parents said, we'll let you have the baby, um, but we don't want you to raise a mixed-race child. You're going to have to uh, take it to an orphanage. And so she took the baby down to an orphanage in Pueblo, Colorado. Now, Fanny did not know this was going on. And, of course, this little baby was Fanny's niece. Her name was Renee. Um, and when she found out, she was furious because she always wanted children of her own. In fact, she treated her nieces and nephews like her own children. So she got in her car. She drove 70 miles an hour to Pueblo. And she walked into that orphanage. And she said, my name is Fannie Mae Duncan. You have a little girl here named Renee Bragg. She is not an orphan. She is my niece. And I'm not leaving Pueblo till we get the right paperwork done and I can adopt her as my own daughter. And that's what she did. She adopted little Renee as her own daughter. She went to live in Fannie Mae's mansion uh, and she had a magical childhood. She had a wonderful childhood uh, with her mother, Fannie Mae Duncan, all the musicians that would come to visit, her grandmother, Maddie Bragg, who lived in that house as well. And of course, all the African-American families that would visit Colorado Springs and stay there. And the proudest day of Fannie Mae's life is when her daughter, graduated from college. Fannie Mae, who always wanted to go to college herself, was just overjoyed at the fact when uh, Renee graduated from Vassar College, as you can see there. What a wonderful story of uh, the fact that she uh, loved her daughter so much that she was willing to adopt her and take care of her. Now, what happened to the Cotton Club? Interesting story. I would say the Camelot years uh, were 1950 to 1965. And in 1965, integration started, and African Americans could stay at the Broadmoor Hotel now, could stay at the Antlers Hotel, could eat in the restaurants in town. Um, and her business started declining because she didn't have this, you know, kind of locked in market of blacks going to her club. Uh, but it didn't bother her. She felt integration was more important than uh, maybe losing a few dollars. And she didn't lose that much. You know, Fort Carson in the 60s started to expand because of the Vietnam War. So there were always enough black and white soldiers that would come to town that would want to go to the Cotton Club and enjoy this great music. And so she still continued uh, to do pretty well till about 1975. And then the people who ran the city were concerned about the Cotton Club because the Cotton Club was just at the entrance of the city. If you were to drive into the city, you would see all these black people milling around. And they didn't want that, want Colorado Springs to have a reputation as a, quote, black town. And so they came up with an idea of how they could end her business, shut her business down and uh, tear down the building. And at that time, Urban Renewal provided federal funding to uh, 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 
condemn buildings and then pay off the owners uh, with a with financial uh, uh, supplement to uh, to allow them to do that. And so they uh, were able to compensate Fanny, uh, but she didn't want to shut down her business. And then they tore down the Cotton Club. And it was a tough time for her. She really didn't like the idea of them closing down the Cotton Club. And she was very bitter to Colorado Springs for a while. In fact, she left Colorado Springs and moved to Aurora uh, and lived with her son, uh, Les Franklin. Uh, but when I met her, she was in her 70s. And at, by that point, she had started to forgive Colorado Springs. And of course, we did the documentary. And in 2005, 50 years after Lou Tilly shot these wonderful photos, because uh, he shot them in 1955, the library decided to have a photo show to honor Fannie Mae Duncan and to honor these beautiful photographs that Lou had donated to the library. And so you can see me in the background there. I'm kind of photo bombing the shot. But they had a wonderful time. Fannie Mae and, and Lou reunited. They're both in their 80s at the time. And it was a great, great photo show. And they were still in pretty decent health from what I remember. But it was the last time I saw either of them because they both died in 2005 of natural causes. Uh, so I did go to Fannie Mae's funeral, and I'm very glad that we were able to honor them both with this photo show in 2005. Now, in 2018, Kay Ismail had raised money uh, to do a bronze sculpture of Fannie Mae Duncan, and uh, they decided to uh, erect it in, in front of the Pikes Peak Center, where today's musicians, musicians come to perform. It's a very appropriate place, of course, where the Cotton Club is or was, is a dirt parking lot now. And so if you go to the Pikes Peak Center, it's right there at the entrance. You'll see this lovely statue. Everybody welcome, Fannie Mae Duncan. She's dressed to the nines. She loved to dress up and she loved to wear these beautiful hats. And it should, it's there forever to honor her contribution to Colorado Springs. Now, again, I highly recommend getting the book on Fannie Mae Duncan. Uh, you can purchase it again through Bob DeWitt. 4730330. It's an excellent book, um, and it tells the story of her life. And you can also see the documentaries on YouTube. My documentary, which was done in 1991, and the Colorado Experience, Fannie Mae Duncan, which is done in 2018. And what I'm going to do, this is the end of the presentation, um, but I'm going to add a little clip of Fannie Mae Duncan at the end of this video, because you can get a sense of of who she was, her personality, what she sounded like. And also, I highly recommend you buying my book. Um, this is only one story in a book that has uh, 50 stories about different people that I met in, during my wonderful career as a librarian, 30 year career. And I really firmly believe that it's important for libraries to record the history of these ordinary people who lived extraordinary lives. And every community has these people. This is not unusual. Fannie Mae Duncans are in every city in this country. And it's important to sit down either with an audio recorder, a video recorder, or even just take photographs and record these remarkable lives. Um, and I'm certainly glad that I had a chance to know Fannie Mae Duncan, become her friend and, and record her wonderful life in uh, video and find the, the wonderful photos that Lutilia had shot. So thank you again, and I appreciate you letting me do this program one more time. Fannie Mae realized the Cotton Club couldn't survive if all she did was cater to the small black community in Colorado Springs. She knew it was important to let everyone know they were welcome in her club. The college students at Colorado College and the white servicemen at Fort Carson spent a lot of money in her club to listen to some of the best musicians in America. Fort Carson was the cause of me being able to survive because by them being mixed, they brought in when, uh, the white boys from out there and uh, Chicanos and everybody else, they came in. And then again, they used to come by, the white boys would want to come in and they'd peep in, anybody else would come and peep in, they wasn't sure where they'd come in. So I cleaned out the whole window where I had uh, advertisement there, I cleaned it all out. And I went to the out west and I got a great big sign, one of those cardboard signs, and I told Ed what to put on there. I just put on there, everybody welcome, and put a big spotlight on it. Wasn't a thing in the window but that. And the people passing by could see it, and business started booming.
It started from Fort Carson. They didn't have to ask nobody nothing. I had five different nationalities of, of, of waitresses. I had five waitresses, and every one of them was different. And that worked. So they didn't have to come in and say, oh, we welcome. I didn't have to call up on the call. They ran me crazy on the phone calling one to come, but the one to know if they was welcome. And I said, all I'm looking for is people that at the age, and I'm not looking for color. I said, now, you're perfectly welcome, and don't feel that way. You'll feel at home after you can. So on my cards, I always said on them, easy to find and hard to leave. <laughs>